So, the Necrons now had a method of swift transit in immortality, weapons of horror and power, and were led by beings that were literally wielding godlike power to reshape the universe at a whim. The Necrons and Catan sprang from their home system like an avalanche, spreading across the stars in all directions. With the power of the Catan, they were unstoppable. The old ones were caught utterly unawares and went down to dust again and again. The march of the Necrons was implacable and invincible. Where the Webway would previously allow the Old Ones to muster fleets to repel them, the Catan would emerge into their systems and would annihilate them with glee. Opening black holes in the midst of thousands of ships, lashing them with power enough to make stars go cold or explode, the slaughter was on a scale that cannot even be conceived of by the present era. Millions and billions were slain as the Catan used the pretext of war to engage on a rampage without end. They would appear in a system and drain every life shred of energy from the living in a twinkle of an eye. But the Old Ones did have a slew of approaches and weapons of phenomenal power of their own. Their previous experience with the Necrontier had enlightened them, and its occurrence had forced them to develop weapons and abilities that they now unleashed in their own defence. They manipulated the warp in such ways as to make entire sectors burn with Imperial fire, could hone their minds into drawing on power that would match even for moments or hours only that displayed by the Catan. For the weapons and energies of the Immaterium, the warp, were ever the only bane of the Catan, but it was only ever enough to force them back or hold them off that just did not command enough power to ever destroy the Catan. The Necrons were ever at the side of the Catan and acted as their shock troops against the Old Ones on land and planet, while the gods slugged it out in the systems and space. Upon victory, the Catan would then descend upon a planet and feast, expunging all life like vampires of legend, but to a scale that would elicit horror in any who witnessed it. The Necrons saw them consume the galaxy one planet at a time, one system at a time. Never sated, never with mercy, never with any indicant that they would ever be satisfied until all life had been sacrificed to their bottomless hunger. And as the war went on, the cryptics of the Necrons continued their advances in their arcane sciences. They gained mastery over light, heat, space and even time. Beside the Catan, they were seemingly children, but compared to anyone else, their power grew to unimaginable levels in the fires of war. Every world they took, every culture they expunged, every species they assisted in annihilating, they stole and harnessed any and all research or knowledge that was to be had. Hence the Necrons grew while their masters ate. This great flame was called War in Heaven, and its tales are endless, but the details now are few. The Old Ones slew the Catan and the Necrons so much, fighting back where they could, that it is believed that the war went on for millions of years, ebbs and flows going one way then the other, but always the onward rush was against the Old Ones. They became desperate and turned their gifts of cultivation and propagation to attempting to forge entire races to be used as cannon fodder against the Necrons and Catan. It is from this period that some races have actually survived, though only a fool would believe that the Catan did not consume a hundred for each that made it to the end of the war. The Kanib, the Jakero, and the Krork and the Eldar are but a few. These races were developed as counters to either the Catan or their endless legions of slaves, the Necrons. Much is made of the import of the Eldar, as they were the bane of the Catan due to their inbuilt power to harness and weaponize the Materium, the Warp. But I personally believe that the Krork were more of a threat to the Necrons, for the Krork were the much more powerful and organized ancestors of the Orcs. But for my thoughts on this race, please see my existing entry on their history. 
Other factors abound in this most complicated and expansive and destructive of all wars. The creation of Dolem Gates, huge portals that allowed the Necrons and Catan to enter the sub-dimension of the webway and invaded such strength as to annihilate all Old One bases therein and remove from them the strategic advantage of movement. Whatever the truth of the matter, or the ebbs and flows of the war, and the reasons it went ever increasingly against the Old Ones, due to the change of the nature of the warp, and the first manifestations of the Enslavers, who we shall explore at another time. The upshot was simple. The Catan and Necrons had won. With perhaps only one exception, the Old Ones had been exterminated. The war in heaven, the greatest and most terrible war of all and any time, had been won by the Catan and the Silent King. Revenge had been exacted. The folly of their refusal to assist the now dead Necrontier had been punished in the ultimate way. But the result was not elation or salvation. It was ashes and emptiness. Cesarek and all his race had paid too high a charge, too high a price, and what had been birthed in that period now ran rampant. Without the Old Ones, the Catan had none who could gainsay them, none who could fetter their excesses. They ran amok in an orgy of ever-escalating annihilation. All pretense was now a thing of the past. The evil deities, the Catan, fell on the galaxy like never before, and ended countless species supping their souls and bioenergies without restraint. But soon, even this was not enough. Some say that the great deceiver, Mephet Ran, could not contain himself, that he was the initiator of this horrific pantomime. But no matter the reason or initial cause, the Ktan fell on each other. The greatest of them, Azak Garod, the Nightbringer, was the cardinal perpetrator, but all of the gods were swiftly following suit. They started to war on each other and consume themselves. A perfect resolution, one might think. Let the butchers butcher each other. Alas, their confrontations were destroying what little remained of the stars and its inhabitants. In their desperation to feed or resist being meals, the power they unleashed was like nothing that had been experienced before. It seemed that the very galaxy would be destroyed by these evil beings if it were not for one person. Cesarek. Cesarek had been slowly mustering his forces, had been secretly plotting, right under the noses of near-omnipotent and omniscient beings. He had been marshalling his power. Now that the Old Ones were gone, now that the Catan were expending their almost limitless power and wiping each other out, he struck. He would pay them back in kind. Oh, how he would pay them back for the destruction of his people. His first victim was none other than Azagarod, the mightiest of the Catan. In a display of arms to honor their god, or so it thought, he had the temerity to summon his master. Azagarod was nonchalantly amused at his servants preparing and displaying a collection of weapons so powerful that even he had to acknowledge his passing respect for the power and destructive ability of his slaves, his Necrons, was ever in his mind just a reflection of his greater glory. He basked in the power he thought he was under his control, until they fired. Cesaric had laid the perfect trap, knowing his master, after countless millennia of service and slaughter, he knew that the Nightbringer would be impressed and his ego stroked and stoked by his vassal's might reflecting his power. But he also knew exactly how he would move, how he would react, what he would do. Cesaric had been plotting for millions of years to this one moment. And when the Nightbringer, as a Garod, the architect and cause of the Necron's race's woe from start to present was in position, he struck. The weaponry that the Necrons had developed, carried on countless vessels of surpassing size, fired as one. They struck their god with such force and potency that he was smashed into a cloud of shards. Cesaric knew 
that to destroy a Catan, let alone their most powerful, as a Garod, was not possible. But he fractured it into shards. So he was prepared. As the shards flew back towards each other to reform the guard and exact their vengeance on their erstwhile puppet slave race, Cesarek showed his genius for he had tasked his cryptex to devise of and forge prisons for the shards. They were called tesseract vaults and tesseract mazes. The prepared objects then flew into space and collected the shards of their god and trapped them for all time. More than this, Cesarek had dreamed of glory as well. Not only were the traps to hold the constituent parts of the god separate, they were also to confer on the Necrons' ability to control said shards. Cesarek the last silent king, had not only shattered and imprisoned a god, the mightiest of all their kind, but he had made of him a slave. The tables had been turned. The silent king had taken the whip from the hand of his master and reversed it. For all time, the shards of the dark god Azagorod would now serve the Necrons, to Baris for short periods when it was then to be controlled and directed to unleash carnage on the enemies of the Necrons. With this greatest gamble, this greatest test performed, the Necrons then universally turned on the remaining star gods. The Catan and one by one, they hunted them down and shattered them, then enslaved them. Even the dark entity known as the Deceiver, the one who had tricked Cesarek and all his race, was captured. Their victory was almost complete. It is said that only two Catan were not enslaved this way. The Void Dragon, who is said to be on Mars, and the Outsider. But for both of these beings, we shall have to wait for another time to tell their tale in more detail. In this way, I state that from my reading of the lore, the war in heaven was finally won by one being, one mighty Titan. The likes has never been replicated in all of the eons of races that have come from them until now the 41st millennium of man. Cesarek, the silent king of the Necrons. So, the dust, as they say, settled, and Cesarek took stock of his position. In the battles against their gods, the Gatan, the Necrons had suffered mightily, despite the result. When one hunts gods that can open singularities in the midst of one of your fleets, then one expects casualties and the roll call of the destroyed was eye-watering. Both of the other pharaons of the Triarch had been slain, and countless millions and billions of his warriors, ships, outposts and materiel. The Necrons had done the impossible. They had defeated not only the Old Ones, but the Catan as well. Despite having these shattered beings as their slaves, their numbers and drive was now spent. The Necrons required a time to rest, to recuperate from this horrific war. Alas, they did not have the luxury of time to do this. For in their desperation to destroy the Catan, they did not notice the building of the numbers, technology and ability and skill of the Eldar and the Krog. Now, many a tomb states that the Eldar were more threatening in their power, but I do not agree. I feel that the Eldar were more a weapon against the Catan, despite how powerful they may have been in their ability to warn the Necrons. But the Krog, ah, the Krog were like an unstoppable force, and far more dangerous in my mind than the Eldar would be to the remaining legions of the Necrons. The Eldar were many and their fleets powerful. The Krog were covering the stars in their mad rampages and their wars. But more importantly, the more a Krog was to fight, the more powerful they became. The Necrons did not seem to, at that present moment, have the power to defeat both of these weaponized races forged specifically for their demise by their old ones. So the position was not enviable. Hence did Cesarek's brilliance come to the fore again. The answer was simple, yet inspired. For the Necrons had many technologies, so advanced that they were akin to magic, even to the other races of that titanic period and chronomancy, the control of time, was one of them. They were also well versed, even from the time before the war in heaven's first stage, in the use and creation of stasis fields. 
Again, Cesaric would lead his people in a gambit designed to slay two birds with one stone. He collected his astromancers, those cryptics who can view the stars and their movement to unveil the pathway of the future, and all of his greatest cryptics of chronomancy and stasis expertise, and he hatched a plan. The Necrons were going to slumber. They would sleep through the ages and avoid a confrontation with the Elder and the Crook. It was inspired, for his astromancers would discern the time that the Eldar fire would gutter out and their power would wane. But also, the merest removal of a target for the Crook, the inability to fight a war of such scope and attrition would hamper them unbelievably. In this he was utterly correct, as the Eldar did indeed sacrifice themselves to their own hubris, and their power was shattered when Slanash was birthed. And the Krook, as predicted. Without the never-ending war that the Necrons would have given them, they devolved into the Orcs. Their power smashed, perhaps for all time, a thing of mad berserk charges. But never again the organized and martial brilliance of the power of the Krook. The Krook became the Orcs. So, Cesaric ordered every single last one of his remaining lords, overlords and pharaons into stasis crypts, time-proof bastilles, where they would languish through the millions of years it would take the Eldar to burn themselves out and the Krook to enfeeble themselves by a lack of suitable opposition. More than this, the Eldar even turned on their erstwhile Krook brothers and culled them to such an extent that they were largely pushed to the very fringes of the galaxy, or enclaves of limited strength surrounded by the power of the Eldar fleets. With what little mirth was still possible for the Solus, Cesarek had his entire people simply go into slumber. With his last action before his people slept, Cesarek gave them the greatest gift yet remaining to him to give. He gave them back their freedom. As the tomb worlds of the Necron slowly winked out of time, he sent a code that would forever destroy the engrammatic programming that forced his people to adhere to his commands. When they awoke, they would forge their own destiny and never would again be slaves to any, not even he. Only Cesarek and his guard, the Triarch Praetorians, would stay awake. Only they would witness the long ages of the galaxy while his people slept. They would take action when required to defend a tomb world, as stated in existing lore. To quote, In the Necron dynasties, the Praetorians held the responsibility of maintaining the Triarch's rule to ensure that wars and politics alike were pursued according to ancient codes. As such, they acted outside the political structures and held both the right and the means to enforce their will should a lord, overlord, or even a pharaon's behavior contravene the edicts of old. However, the Triopratarians also held a higher responsibility to ensure that the Necron dynasties never fell, that their codes of law and order did not vanish into the darkness. In this they failed. To all intents and purposes, the war in heaven saw the destruction of the Necron dynasties. Though the Triopratarians fought at the forefront of that cataclysm, their efforts were not enough. That shame hung heavy on the survivors and drove them to forsake hibernation. As the initial sparks of the war in heaven burnt out, the last Triarch Praetorians withdrew to the Necrontier's ancient seats of power on the Northern Rim, preserving what they could from the vengeance of the Elder Eye. From the concealed fortresses, the Triarch Praetorians plotted for that day, many millennia distant though it was when the Necrons would emerge to dominate the galaxy once again. Yet they knew there was a good chance that the untested stasis technology would fail and that their sleeping kin would never wake. So it was that the Triarch Praetorians came to travel widely throughout the galaxy, masquerading as grim-faced gods on countless primitive worlds. They brought the codes of the Necron tier to credulous primitives, reshaping cultures according to their own ideals. Few civilizations wholly embraced the Triarch Praetorians' teachings. Many more were exterminated by wars, natural disaster, or the vengeful outriders of Craftworld Alatok, who sought to undo the work of the Triarch wherever they could. Nonetheless, 
Fragments of Triarch lore and archaeotech survive on worlds not seen by Necron eyes in many thousands of years. Now, as the Necrons stir ever more into wakefulness, the Triarch Praetorians have sensed an opportunity to expunge their failure. They are traveling across the galaxy, tomb world to tomb world, rebinding the sundered pieces of the Necron dynasties. It will be a long and interminably slow process, for the galaxy is vast beyond imagining, and the locations of ne many Necron worlds have been lost. But the Tarak Praetorians have patience enough for the search, and a burning determination to see it done. Once a tomb world has been con contacted and bound into the newly founded dynasties, a host of Triarch Praetorians is assigned to that world in perpetuity to govern its protocols and act in its defense. So it is the formations of Triarch Praetorians are often founded at battle's forefront in the defense against invaders and campaigns of reclamation alike. Even could he do so, no noble would refuse such assistance, for extreme age has little dulled the Triarch Praetorian squad's combat skills. Triarch Praetorians seldom fight in a battle's initial waves, preferring to hover above the fray on gravity displacement packs. From here they watch carefully, not only for the moment at which their intercession will have the most impact, but also to observe the foe's actions. Though Triarch Praetorians share the unusual Necron contempt for any race that is not their own, they are very watchful for an opponent marked millennia ago by their influence, and sometimes proclaim such creatures honorable foes against whom the codes of battle must be observed. This can prove frustrating to an army's commander. Such niceties are unwelcome in impediments to the battle's prosecution, but it would be a bold Nemesaur indeed who overruled the wishes of a Triarch Praetorian. End quote. Millions of years passed. Some say twenty, some say more, but millions passed. Cesarek's existence and his ways of passing the eons can only be guessed at, his intrigues and actions unfathomable. But eventually, even he tired of the Milky Way galaxy. After seeing the fall of the Elder and the rise of the Imperium, the degeneration of the Quark to Orcs, he felt assured that his people would arise in might, would soon inherit the galaxy, as was his plan. He felt his duty done, after all the long years and then decided to abdicate his power further and allow his people freedom even from his presence. So Zarek took a vessel and some of his guard and left. The Silent King banished himself from the galaxy and began his sojourn to explore other galaxies, other realms. He journeyed into the void between galaxies and there came to a terrifying discovery. For Zarek, the Silent King found the endless fleets of the Great Devourer. When he was out there between galaxies, he found the mass hibernating ships of the Tyranids, and all of them were headed towards the Milky Way galaxy. All of them headed towards his people. Cesaric turned around and hastened back to his home. Since then, he has tasked his Praetorian guard to go amongst the many slumbering tomb worlds of the Necrons and awaken them as swiftly as possible. Under a shroud of secrecy, never revealing his true identity, the Silent King has worked indefatigably and as swiftly as possible to rouse his people so that they are at their full power. Only by doing this will they stand even a chance of resisting the predations of the masses of the Hive Fleets who inexorably chew through what he considers the kingdom of his people, the Necrons. But for six editions, over twenty years in the real world, the Necrons have been awakening, going from enigmatic and unpredictable raiding undead space hordes all the way through to their present incarnation. But now they are awake. Now they are not only mobilizing, they are reactivating their most awe-inspiringly destructive weaponry and equipment and preparing for unfettered war once more. Nor has Azarek just been doing that. He has been reaching out slowly and tentatively to other races. He is reputed to have tried to make contact with Sanguinius, possibly by going back in time by chronomancy to the 31st millennium during the Great Crusade. He has ordered his people to fight alongside the forces of the Imperium, as has recently been seen, again with the Blood Angels. But this shows amazing prescience, 
for if any being was to inherit the mantle of emperor, should the master of mankind abdicate, it would have been Sanguinius, not Horus. Horus was only the war master. Sanguinius was to be the emperor. Also it shows thought beyond any of his people. For although they are willing to offer warnings and act honorably toward humanity and other races that are not a direct weapon of the old ones, as are the Eldar on Krook, it shows he is now willing to work even with the lesser races to stop the Tyranids. A huge step indeed. So, let us now get to the heart of the matter. Let us sum up the being and his impact on the galactic stage. Knowing all that we know now from the previous entries I've made for his people, the Necrons. And what a picture we are to paint. I do not think anyone really understands the position. So, let us go off script, as I say, and let us begin. Ever were the Necrons and the Necrontia a fractious and bellicose people, but they were not idiots, and the one thing that has proven to unify them completely has been an external threat. When Cesarek, the Silent King, finally reveals himself, he is the only Necron who all others will follow. If they choose not to do so freely, as they now are not enforced to do so, as some will point out, he has his Praetorians in every court, every chamber of power of the Pharaons, overlords, and lords of his people. Resistance or rebellion will be met with swift destruction and replacement with a more tractable and compliant noble. And when the king returns, they will all know it. His Praetorians are everywhere. Some might say that one person who may refuse his order would be the greatest general the galaxy has ever seen. Imhotek the Storm Lord. But if you have heard my entry on this Goliath, then you will know that he only sees the reins of power from the Sautic nobility as he was vexed at their squabblings. If his king were to return, then this Nemesaur would be more than willing to bend the knee. Now imagine the entire Necron armies under the command, under the combined command of the genius Zandrek and the unsurpassable brilliance of Imotek. Not in command of millions, but Billions of Necron warriors in unending legions. Could any threat, could any threaten armies led by these beings? Then factor in Trazine, the Necron who can go anywhere, take anything, can stealth a thousand death marks or wraiths into any castle or keep, infested by those unwilling to join with his king. Then we get to the Cryptex. Cesarus can take entire systems of thralls fitted with mind scabs to practically dance their way into biotransference furnaces to augment the armies of the Necrons. Nor will they be able to resist any command after the compliance engrams have been embedded. But what of Oricon and his ability to use astromancy to predict the future and understand the past? The ability to slip backwards in time and change the very course of action and reaction to any and all of the plans of Imatek and his lord? What of the weapons that were used to break apart the Catan themselves? I surmise that they were hidden in the darkest depths of the galaxy, like the much lesser weapons called the Trinkets of Vol by the Eldar, backstone fortresses. But can they be reactivated? Their might was enough to shatter the most powerful beings the galaxy has ever known. Their power must eclipse the backstone fortresses by degrees. No weapons in the history of the galaxy, even those used by the humanity or the Elder at the height of their power, come come even close to their destructive potentials. And do bear in mind that the abilities of Oricon, time, travel, are not his purview alone. With every court and every cryptic under Cesarek's control, he could make the time war of the Daleks and the Time Lords of Doctor Who Looks like a child's finger-painting party. And I repeat, this is but one of the disciplines of the Necron Cryptex that have been revealed in any detail. 
one among thousands. Nor do the Necrons have the issue of stagnating or regressing technology as the humans and Eldar do. Although the Crypturks do not have the brilliance they did when they were Necron tier, the Necron Cryptics are still progressing and have done so for the millennia since their awakening. What wonders are they now capable of that would even outstrip their power when they were first went into stasis? Nor can anyone escape them in the seemingly safe places of the webway, as the Necrons have not forgotten how to make dolem gates and can do so again if required. There is nowhere, even in that sub-realm of the warp, that they cannot go should the need arise. They can manipulate, construct and charge Blackstone to cut entire regions of space, if not eventually the entire galaxy from the predations and influence of the warp. They contain the Eye of Terror and can, if they wish hard enough, if they work hard enough to extend it to levels where no psychic ability will be more than a party trick in power from one end to another. One wonders how this will affect the shadow in the warp and the hive mind, for without that the Tyranids are merely fodder for his weapons. They are also strong indications that the Tau came out of nowhere, that their genesis may be another race. Some have hinted that it may well be the Eldar who have manipulated their genes to development, but in my mind this makes absolutely no sense at all. The Eldar had millions of years to potter around and play God, but their intrinsic self-absorption had never led them down the pathway to attempt to copy their makers, the Old Ones. Nor are the Tau psychically attuned, a facet that the Eldar lured above nearly all others. Why would they purposefully create what they would consider a half-made inferior race? It does not match their self-image. But what if Cesarek finally outdid his old enemies, the Old Ones? by not only copying their gardening ways, but by perfecting them. He had the time to do so, or at least to learn the ways of the old ones. He was active for over 20 plus million years before the peasant era, hidden. And doing what exactly? Perhaps it was this, learning all of the secrets of his defeated foe that were not reliant on the warp. Now what if the Silent King found out about the Tyranids and decided he wished or required to have another race that would be much more akin to his own, the Tau, technologically advanced and all of the things he would wish, unified, strong, cooperative, ready to be activated when he required, and who had the inbuilt technical brilliance that his Krepchiks once possessed, but was blunted by the biotransference and then compounded by the long sleep in stasis. What if he went back in time, as it is surmised might have happened when he attempted to contact with Sanguinius, and then sowed the seeds of the Tau, so that they would be ready when he needed them, like now? They have a soul, but a weak one, one that is almost invisible in the warp. Does this not sound like the perfect race to evolve into adequate, if not ever perfect, shells for the sentience of his people? What if Cesaric is actually architect of the Tau race? Would he not build in a way to control them, as the Ethereals are clearly already doing to their own people? So similar to the ways the Catan controlled his own people. Does that not sound more likely than the Eldar getting off their arrogant, psychically overblown posteriors? Cesaric also controls the power of the shards of the Catan those beings who can be directed to create black holes in the midst of fleets, or over fortress worlds, or even over Holy Terror itself. Nor is Cesaric limited in his patience, diplomacy, or cunning. The king who waited literally scores of millions of years to exact his vengeance is not to be underestimated. Let that sink in. He plotted and waited and schemed for millions of years. The willpower, the sheer patience and ability of this being is untouchable in all of the characters of the Warhammer universe. Cesaric is the man directly responsible for the death of the gods and progenitors of the Eldar, Kror, Jokero and Knib. He literally killed their creators. Then he went on to outmaneuver, outthink, then outfight the Katarn, his own star gods the most powerful beings that the galaxy has ever known. 
He got his courtiers to predict the fall of the Eldar and the devolution of the Krog. Cesaric also harbors one dream that he will fight for until his dying day. He dreams that one day that his people will be able to reverse the biotransference and have their personalities return to flesh for them to regain their very souls. For them to do that, he needs to make sure that the Great Devourer, the Tyranids, are defeated and then all other potential threats are destroyed. He is a being of infinite subtlety and willing to make compacts with the Imperium, perhaps to even use them as the beings his people will transfer their consciousness to, but they will never suspect it or see it coming. Cesaric is the last of his kind, the last Necrontier Silent King, and he is the first of his kind, the first Necron Silent King, and he is coming. He is on the verge of throwing off his veil of secrecy, his cloak of obfuscation. And when he does this, oh, when he does this, when he comes into his full might, not all the four gods of chaos combined and all their teeming minions, not all the Eldar craft worlds, exolite worlds, or their gods of war, trickery, or death, not all the legions of the Imperium, their tanks, ships, or titans, not all of the hordes of the green tide, prophet of Gork and Mork at their head, or not, not all of the psychic might of the Emperor, not even the God Emperor Ascendant, not any of it will be able to stop him. For Zarek may be the saviour of the entire Milky Way galaxy, and woe to any foolish enough to stand in his way. Barabbas Villiers awoke on a cold and hard surface that smelt of sterilizer, yet still had the dried blood of its last guest spattered across its edges. As the Inquisitor's eyes adjusted to the burning bright light from above, he took in his surroundings. He was in a room of maybe twenty meters square and saw countless instruments and utensils on the walls. He was raised off the ground on what could only be described as an operating table its cold metal stiffening his muscles round his naked back. His arms were extended to either side, and although he could see no physical restraints, he was utterly unable to move them. Villiers saw one figure in the room move toward him smoothly and slowly. There was a regal air to his movement and his stance as he finally stood above the table. No white coat or drills as Villiers had expected. Instead, there was just a metallic gold sheen reflecting light from every single angle on the being of metal. His eyes shone with a lampant green glow as his unmoving features opened and a sound escaped what the Inquisitor could only believe to be its mouth. It spoke in perfect high gothic, but the sound was like the voice of ages, a rumble that seemed to be coming from not only a bottomless cavern, but from the ends of the universe or from a different time long ago. It sounded old, but most of all, it sounded powerful. More certain and assured than any voice Phileas had ever heard in all the decades of his life. No, control your anguish, little mortal, for we are not here to extinguish your life, your fire. We were intrigued by you. Of all the beings in this galaxy, only you have had the skill to track us. Only you have uncovered our secret. Brabus Filia's mind was confused for a moment. We? Us? Then realization dawned on him. This being was using the third person. It was him. He was in the presence of him. The one he had tracked for nigh on seven decades of his life, but never been sure, never believed that it could be possible that he had stumbled onto the path, the trail of this individual, this legend. Yes, 
Even our own subjects are less skilled than you are. We have read your journals and logs. We are almost flattered, or would be, if we were not who we are. Your awe is justified. It said with all of the confidence that Vilius had recognized immediately. Barabbas, the man, knew his own awe had indeed been justified. If only a tenth of what was said about this person was true, this was an honor that could only be compared with a personal visitation of his own holy emperor. We will make good use of you. You will be used to take our terms to the lords of your people one day. For the now, we are not ready, and nor are your lords, for they do not even now understand the depths of their need of our assistance and protection. One day, you will take our offer and our terms to them. It will not be the same world to which you will awake, but then is it ever. As the words sunk into the mind of Barabbas Villiers, a field of energy enveloped him, and his breathing ended. His pulse stopped, his every movement halted, as he was placed in a stasis field. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. If you have enjoyed this introduction to Cesarek, the silent king of the Necrons, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you are a regular gentle listener and see worth in what we are doing, then please do consider supporting us on Patreon, as more content will be coming very soon. Now, no matter what you do today, do not plan to stand in the way of the Silent King, but more importantly, do try to make some time for fun today. Toodaloo.